just about to launch into the introduction to this video. I've walked into bright sunlight there on my face. I think in the naturalistic way in which I approach these videos, I should just keep that going. It would have blown out the shot. But I was just about to launch into the introduction to this video and I bumped into to Jamie who watches the videos and actually sent me a link to a digital map, a slider, where you can slide across and see Victorian maps and contemporary maps. Lovely to meet you, Jamie. And like I like to think of the people that watch these videos, he was walking along the street holding a pint of beer. That's the spirit, Jamie, that's the way to roll. Well, to introduce the video today, we're picking up the City of London Churches uh, series that I've been, I th when did I start? It was probably a year ago, actually. It must have been, yeah, it was probably last summer. And I love making these videos. I almost don't want to get to the end, so I'm going to kind of like, eke it out by including some of the other little sites along the way, some of the, the towers that don't have a church. I think we might have one here, although it does look like it's got a church. I think I may have blown my introduction already, but um, yeah, I've been working through these videos. Hopefully you've seen a few of them. If not, I'll link below. I should probably do a playlist at this point. And yeah, I've done 22 of the 39 surviving churches in the city of London. That's just in the square mile. There are originally 108. Wow, that's amazing, isn't it? Before the, well, so before the Great Fire, a number of fates befell the city churches. Um, I've recapped this in, in previous videos, but it doesn't hurt repeating. That's the wonderful sound of uh, a wheelie suitcase over these kind of like cobbles. There were 108 city churches, the Great Fire of London did for a lot of them. Quite a number were rebuilt by Sir Christopher Wren after the Great Fire, so some of those are on our tour, some of them included in all the videos. And then of course you had a reorganisation of the city churches and the parishes in the 1860s that got rid of a bunch of other churches and then finally you had the Second World War uh, where a lot of the city churches were bombed out. Um, but some of them remain as graveyards, some of them um, remain there's just like a plaque on the wall, some of them have gardens. So. You know, I think today we're going to have a bit of a smorgasbord of all of these little features and a few other treats beside. Let's crack on. And literally, just as I was saying about taking in other places along the way, look, this little garden here I had no idea existed. Distaff Lane Garden, which is quite a new garden. Isn't it beautiful? I think it was created in 2018. And in the spirit of these videos, I often stumble upon the churches, and here is my, uh, my first, St Nicholas Cole Abbey. And this has features from a Wren church in it from the 1670s. But then also it was, um, it was bombed out in 1941 and it's been restored, it was gutted. I think the tower, the tower has a very distinctive kind of Wren feel about it, doesn't it? And once again, I'm, I'm using John Betjeman's wonderful City of London Churches guidebook, which is a real, um, which has been guiding me all the way, and I love it. We are in the, uh, we're in the ward of Bread Street, and here we can see Old Fish Street Hill. Yeah, it's a very short section of the street heading up towards Cheapside, and I believe this is one of the old markets where people could unload their fish. Cheapside was the old name for a market. We'll deal with that later. That's kind of the, the kind of route. We're sort of looping around Cheapside today. I love the way you've got all these hills leading off from the higher ground around Corn Hill and Ludgate Hill down towards the Thames. Here we have Huggin Hill. Not really on the route we're going to take, but I'm tempted to go down there anyway. Or should I stick to the plan? Stick to the plan. This is Great Trinity Street. And now we go down Garlic Hill. And at the bottom of Garlic Hill, I can see our next church. Wow, it looks resplendent. has a really magnificent Portland stone steeple, which is incredible. Real, really beautiful church, considering that it was quite badly bombed and it's been restored. 
after the war. Apparently, uh, due to the height of the windows, I think, it's known as Wren's Lantern. Another little detail I love from Detriman's description is that the pews include sword rests. I love these city lanes, walking down here along Skinner's Lane beside St. James Garlic Hive. There's been a church here since the 12th century and the name refers to the place where garlic was unloaded, a hive being a landing place and the garlic coming from, from France along with wine. You can just imagine the scene, can't you? You have to remember the banks of the Thames were wider in those days and you can see the streets leading down there. The Thames is a little bit further on the other side of those buildings. It would have been a scene of great activity around here. The tower was finished by Nicholas Hawksmoor in 1717 and aside from Wren, Hawksmoor is another of the great figures associated with the city churches. He's also beloved of kind of people that are intrigued by the mysteries of London and have speculated about the sacred geometries that were laid out by Hawksmoor. So here we have St Mary Alder Mary, or St Mary the Elder. It's on the junction of, of Watling Street, which I don't know if this section is, relates to the Watling Street that cuts across London, because that seems to cross near Westminster and heads out to Anglesey. I walked some of that with Ian Sinclair, but there's a good chance that this is part of the old Roman road through the city. And this is, uh, well, there is some of the, I think there's some of the old medieval church. It was rebuilt in 1510, there was an older church and then it was badly damaged in the Great Fire. And uh, like many of the churches we'll see today, rebuilt by Sir Christopher Wren. A classic of the Gothic Revival, so it says. It feels like such a rare kind of treat to actually get inside one of the churches. It was really lovely. That ceiling is incredible. There was a little service going on down the front there, so I didn't want to um, dwell too long. It seemed like a little private affair. I think there was uh, someone joining them on a laptop. Interesting, modern times. Just behind the church is Bow Lane, one of the few surviving streets in its original form of the old medieval city of London. It's a real gem with little sort of cafes and shops and whatnot. And you can see here how Bow Lane is bisected by the ancient Watling Street. Some people believe that Watling Street is so old that it originates as an animal track, like a, a migratory route that then humans followed, followed the animals and became an ancient trackway. And the information board outside ye old Watling pub here says that it's believed to have been built by Sir Christopher Wren for the workers rebuilding St Paul's Cathedral following the Great Fire and the pub was constructed in 1668. Love is it was constructed from straight lengths of uh, brine pickled timber from old ships that were sold cheaply to builders. Isn't that fantastic? And you can see the proximity to St Paul's Cathedral just there. So you can see that we've walked around in a loop. We're going to go a little bit further north and then turn east. Isn't this a beautiful building here? It's now called the Pavilion End, it's a sports bar, but I wonder what it was originally. I think I absolutely have to go down here, down Groveland Court. Here it tells us that Williamson's Tavern dates back to the 17th century, built not long after the Great Fire of London. The site became the address of the new Mayor of London and the wrought iron gates, a gift from William III and Mary II, who are thought to have dined here. Amazing. And here is St Mary Le Beau, which is a really looks like a really huge building, isn't it? Again, it's another church that was rebuilt by Wren, but again gutted by fire during the Second World War. 
So I think a lot of it could be quite modern. There was a much older church here, and beneath the church there was a Norman crypt dating from around 1090. And in the middle of Bow Churchyard, we have a statue here of Captain John Smith, who was among the leaders of the, uh, the Jamestown settlement in Virginia. His dates are from 1580 to 1631. I'll correct that on the screen. So this is Cheapside now, which apparently was where the citizens of London fought a battle against William the Conqueror a couple of months after the Battle of Hastings. A number of momentous events recorded in these streets that we'll look for now. According to Ed Glinner in his brilliant The London Compendium, which I highly recommend to all of you, is that Cheapside was London's main medieval market until one of the Norman kings, Henry II, Henry III, I've forgotten since I just read it, <laughs> they, he changed the unloading of fish to Queen Hive and then that um, shifted the balance of power away from this as the main medieval market. But there was also one of the crosses here. Again, one of the Henrys, I think it's Henry III. You know, he uh, put crosses where the body of Queen Eleanor was rested as it was carried to its final resting place. And the names are carried forward. We have Waltham Cross, we have Charing Cross, but there was also one here in Cheapside that was uh, removed. It kept being attacked by Puritans. But I think the church that was beside, there is a churchyard on the other side of the street here. So we can cross over, avoiding the, Avoiding the bus, let's go to the site of, the, uh, of one of the great crosses. So yeah, just up in Wood Street here, we have St Peter's Churchyard. There's not much signage on it, is it? This was where St Peter's West Cheap once stood. This is our first ghost church of the day, and here's the churchyard. A cross stood somewhere near this churchyard here. It's kind of strange that it wasn't returned once the, uh, you know, the Puritan outrages ended. Now I want to go in search of the birthplace of what you could argue is one of the most important Londoners or one of the most famous Londoners. You could say she's one of the most important people in post-Norman English history. Is that too grand a claim? Not through what he did during his life, but it's his death that is significant. Some of you already guess. I've, that's a very broad description, but you'll guess because I'm in Cheapside and you'll know which famous person was born in Cheapside. I wonder if there's a mark. We don't even know if there's anything here to, to mark his birthplace. That'll be interesting if there isn't. Here on the corner of Ironmonger Lane in Cheapside is where Thomas a. Beckett or Thomas Beckett was born in 1118. Yeah, the fellow who became the Archbishop of Canterbury and took on Henry II, for which he was murdered by Henry's knights. It's debatable whether Henry knew about it or not. The biography of Beckett that I read says the whole thing about the, that famous line of who will rid me of this troublesome priest was actually made up much later. And I think that plaque on the wall there is there to mark Thomas a. Beckett's association with his spot, but it's quite modest, isn't it? Here we go, a bit more of a traditional plaque here. St Thomas a. Beckett was born in a house near this spot, keeping it quite plain there, aren't they? So Beckett was canonised or Beatified. What's the difference between being canonised and beatified? Anyway, he was made a saint uh, two years after his murder, which is intriguing, isn't it? And I read a biography of Beckett a few years ago, and very, very intriguing character, Beckett. Um, his early life, he wasn't pious at all. Uh, he was actually a bit of a playboy, so he didn't seem set for a life of religion. Um, I think in the biography I, I read, they kind of make some insinuations about his sexuality, perhaps his relationship with one of the princes. I think he knew Henry when Henry was young as well. So they were kind of close mates and that's how he ended up becoming Archbishop. And much to a lot of people's surprise, he wasn't really seen as being a religious man at all. But then once given the job of Archbishop, he took it really seriously, a bit too seriously for Henry's liking. And where I think it's a story that has a lot of kind of modern resonance is really 
it became a battle between who held power, church or state, church or the king, the monarch or the church, and the church then being based in Rome. And Henry didn't think anybody had authority over the king, or certainly nobody on earth could have any kind of higher authority than the king. But then, of course, there were kind of like legal ramifications because you had, you had the church courts and, of course, you had the law of the land. And at that point, the church thought that any kind of uh, any clergyman was uh, beyond the reach of the law of the king. And, of course, the king strongly disagreed with that. Uh, at its heart, of, it, must have, it was probably a tussle over money and land and who owned what and who had power. So it was actually quite a political kind of um, struggle between the two of them for which Beckett paid with his life. What I particularly liked, though, was the description of this area when Beckett was a young man growing up. Due to the number of settlers from France that had come over in the years after the Norman invasion, and we've tended to think in the past, some history books I've read always say that it was exaggerated that people came with the Normans. But um, whether that was true or not in the country as a whole, but certainly uh, a lot of people from France had come and settled here and it was very, very common to hear Norman French spoken in the streets of London around Cheapside. Well, look here, another demolished church, site of St Mildred's Church demolished in 1872. Not burnt down, not bombs, just demolished. And this is an interesting link back to the, uh, the Horn Church in Upminster video. Elizabeth Fry, the prison reformer, lived here, and it was her son that lived at uh, Fair Kites Hall in Upminster, or in Horn Church, sorry, I should say. Okay, one more church, which I think is just down here. And here in Lombard Street, we have St Mary Walnuth. I think that's the correct pronunciation. And Lombard Street here is named after the Italian merchants who set up here in the Middle Ages as, as moneylenders, as bankers. And they originated from Lombardy. The church is a Hawksmoor church. Quite a grand church it is too, isn't it? One of Ian Sinclair's most uh, seminal works, most influential works, was a book called Lud Heat. It was very, one of his very early books. Which where a lot of those, uh, his ideas of psychogeography really started to enter the culture. And within it is this idea that Nicholas Hawksmoor, who I believe would have been a Freemason, laid out his churches along a particular pattern. I'm not sure if it makes a pentagram or some kind of occult symbol when plotted on a map. I talked about this in a previous video. Knowing Ian, it would have been a playful device. It would have been a kind of literary thing, a way to kind of like open up the landscape. Um, Peter Ackroyd was, I think, influenced by this and he wrote a book called Hawksmoor. And these ideas actually really, when people think about psychogeography today in London, they think of things like these kind of sacred alignments, these mysteries, the, uh, the occult and uh, ley lines and all that kind of jazz really, which is a long way from the, <laughs> a long way from what the, the French intellectuals of the situ Situationist International were, were, uh, were thinking of. But um, yeah, it's interesting when you see a Hawksmoor church, I always think of what, uh, what he, with, of Ian's idea, his playful idea. Well, that um, concludes this particular chapter of my walk around the City of London churches, or the churches of the City of London. I'll get that right eventually. We've still got at least one more episode to go. I'm kind of, <laughs> I'm stringing them out, as you can tell. I could have done another two or three today, but I thought, no, I'm going to save the Guild Hall for the next video, because then we can do the Guild Hall as well. So as I always like to say, thank you for joining me on this walk, and I look forward to seeing you on the next walk, wherever that may be. Thank you.